In the late 1800s, Toledo leadership hoped to capitalize on local natural resources to attract new businesses and cultivate a glass industry. Offering tempting incentives, city leaders caught the attention of Edward Drummond Libby, a young man who had recently taken over his father's struggling Massachusetts glass company. They made him an offer he couldn't refuse. They offered him $100,000 to build his factory here, 50 lots for homes for his workers, basically a huge incentive plan for him to bring the New England Glass Company to Toledo. And so that's what he did. He loaded up his workers, loaded up his equipment, took a train out to Toledo. And when Libby arrived in Toledo in 1888, it was a huge celebration. But the newly relocated Libby Glass Company did not get off to an easy start. Libby's factory was struggling to, to survive. It was really, you know, a brand new factory. There were lots of problems with the equipment, lots of problems with setting up the factory. So many of these workers became very discouraged and within a few months of coming to Toledo, took the train and went back to Massachusetts, leaving Libby with a brand new factory and nobody to run it. So, Libby traveled to Wheeling, West Virginia, a major hub of glass production. This is where Edward Libby, the refined, educated New Englander, first happened upon Michael J. Owens. Michael Owens was a very different man from Edward Drummond Libby. He was from a large Irish family, a very poor family. And as a superintendent at the glass factory, he was known for his rather salty language and his demanding management style, which uh, turned a lot of people off, but made him the kind of person that Libby realized he needed if he was going to instill any discipline in his workers and if he was ever going to get this company off the ground. So he recruited Owens to come to Toledo to be a superintendent and manager at his, at his factory. Libby also put Owens in charge of a glass plant in Findlay, Ohio, to make light bulbs for the new electrical industry. Uh, fortunately, in 1890, there was a major strike and in New York at the Corning Glass Works where they were making electric light bulbs for the new electric industry. And General Electric needed a supply of light bulbs. So they came to Libby and asked if he would be able to take up the slack to produce the bulbs that were necessary. That incident, I think, really established in Libby's mind just how valuable Owens was to the future of the company. Yet the company continued to struggle. To be successful, the company would need to become a household name, and Libby conceived of a plan to make this happen. He had a glass furnace constructed at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition. Putting Owens in charge, the Libby company offered brand-named glass souvenirs to draw crowds. In uh, 1893, in the Chicago World's Fair, it made such a splash, Libby Glass, that it became world known. And Toledo was, he, the original trademark had Toledo on it. That, that really gave it its fame. However, it would be Michael Owens' innovations that would truly fuel the company's future success. Owens had begun experimenting with automated machines at the light bulb plant. Impressed with his work, Libby created the Toledo Glass Company, where Owens would continue to refine his inventions and turn his attention to glass bottle production. The production of glass bottles in, in the 19th century and early 20th century was, had differed very little from the way glass bottles were produced um, 2,000 years before. It was basically, um, you had a skilled glass blower, and you had him, his assistants were um, often young boys called blower's dogs, and they were anywhere from 10 to 15 years old. And there were usually five or six of them that worked with a single glass blower. One of the most extensive uses of child labor at the time, glass production was labor intensive, and it was young boys charged with the hardest, most dangerous work, work Michael J. Owens knew all too well. Since he had been in this business since he was 10 years old, just how dangerous it was for young boys like himself to be doing this kind of work. So he envisioned a machine that would look like a blowpipe. It would blow glass out into a mold and then the piston would reverse and it would you know make sure that the entire mold was filled with the molten glass and you could do this automatically and if you did it with several arms you could produce multiple bottles at the same time it was a very simple idea but it took Owens a very long time to perfect the technology to make this automatic bottle machine successful 
Once Michael Owens perfected the bottle machine, its use helped end child labor in the glass industry. Cheaper, quicker production methods also brought about another transformation. Michael Owens' automated bo bottle machine uh, really it revolutionized the industry. It was the first change in probably four centuries in glass making. It was somewhat evolutionary. I mean, yet Michael had done some things with uh, glass molds and, and some automated molds and things like that, but it was also very revolutionary. His final automated machine was totally automated and uh, quite a change. And it took, for example, a, a factory, a hand-blowing bottle factory at the time, could probably at best produce about 3,600 bottles. Uh, his first operational machine, Machine A, could do about 17,000 bottles in a day. And then the reduction of cost caused something very unusual to happen. People started to use glass bottles. By producing cheap, uniform bottles, the automatic bottling machine made possible the distribution of foods at greatly reduced costs and helped create a boom in the beer, pharmaceutical, and other industries. The soda industry would not have been possible without it. Eventually, the Owens Bottle Machine Company was created to begin manufacturing the machines to sell to companies. And later, the new Owens Bottle Company began making bottles themselves. The Owens Bottle Company continued to grow after the company changed from producing machinery to producing the glass bottle and became a very large, almost a global company because it did have facilities in England and in other places in Europe as well. Unfortunately, Owens himself died at a very young age. He was only 64 years old. Owens' invention was not simply the result of inspired genius. An entrepreneur as well as inventor, Michael J. Owens worked with engineers and technicians and had the support of Libby Capital to make the bottle machine a success. And what I find very interesting about Owens is the way that he bridged the world between the worker and the glass factories and the owner of the and operator of glass industry. Libby brought the glass industry to Toledo, but Owens made it successful, and I think they probably both recognize that. In 1929, the Owens Bottle Company and Illinois Glass merged to become Owens, Illinois, with its headquarters in Toledo. The companies have always been important to the local economy. Today, the manufacturing base is gone. However, Toledo continues as the company's global headquarters, and will always be known as the glass capital of the world.